Welcome to You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton and we're here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital and a special guest tonight. Dr. Rogers, would you introduce our guest? I'd be pleased to, Mr. Horton. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Kim is a veterinarian at the North Star Veterinary Specialist and it's, I'm an honor, honor to have her here today. She is one of the people that we talk to when we have problems with animals that have cancer. One of the things that Dr. Kim does, or the big thing that Dr. Kim does, is treat cancer. And her specialty is limited to the practice of oncology in animals. Uh, I should point out that many of our other guests have been boarded at, at this point. Dr. Kim is early in her career and she will take her boards. So she is uh, limiting her specialty to only oncology and will be writing her boards and she'll be successful in the very near future. I have to ask a question, and I know we talked about this mm -hmm. before we came on the air, but it wasn't that long ago when, a can and when an animal, be it a dog or a cat or some other animal, had cancer, that was a death sentence right. for, the, for the pet. What's happened? What, 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 what has happened to make oncology now a specialty for animals? Well, I think it's, it used to be that animals died of old age because people wouldn't do those tests to determine what their animal was sick with. So I don't think that we're seeing more cancer because that's a question I get a lot too is why is there so much more cancer? I don't think it's more cancer. I think that people have decided that pets are a family member. You're hearing that more and more about pets being family members. So they're willing to visit practices like North Star Vets and go to a specialty practice and do those higher tests. And then when they realize that there's a diagnosis of cancer, they're willing to take those extra steps to treat them um, and we are, we are able to extend good quality of life many times in these animals. I think another point might be is that we as general practitioners, especially those of us who have graduated in the last 10 to 15 to 20 years, we've been educated better in identifying cancers and then being able to send them on to someone who can then treat them, mm -hmm. uh, such as Dr. Kim. So what kind of a background do you have to have to be an oncologist in, for, in veterinary medicine? Uh, is, is it exactly the same as humans or is it limited? Or it's, what? it's similar, maybe slightly different. So we do our four years of vet school um, and then you do a year of internship typically. I did an extra year of internship where I did an oncology specific internship. And then most people will do a three year residency. Um, and then with the residency, you also have to publish a paper and pass a board exam. Okay. And how long has there been specialty in oncology? Did it really, it started when, in the 90s and the 80s? I, I, I think, let's see, I met Sean Connor who was doing oncology in um, D.C. in the mid-90s. He was one of the first people to do it. Um, my mentor, Dr. Kitchell, has been doing it for about 30 years, so I would say probably it, it's a relatively new um, specialty within the veterinary world. I think we've always recognized the need for treatment of cancer, mm -hmm. but with the development of better cancer drugs that seem to be a little bit less expensive, I think that's what brings the veterinarians on board because it's no longer your insurance paying for it, it's now you are paying it for, you, for your animal and so there's a lot of developments that have to occur and I yeah. think Dr. Kim will agree that it's been really ramped up in the last 10 to 20 years. Oh yeah, in the past five years we have drugs and a melanoma vaccine that are specifically made for animals so I think the drug companies are recognizing that this is an area where owners are willing to spend money and are developing products for that. Now, when we're dealing with cancers in pets, does each type of pet react differently to a cancer, or, or is it all pretty much the same kind of presentation? Does, it, does a, cat, a cancer in a cat, is that quite different from a cancer in a dog? Yeah. Yeah, I, I always, when I have students, when I was teaching at Michigan, I would tell students cats are not small dogs, and you know, you hear that all the time when you're in vet school, but it's really true, like cats don't respond the same as dogs, and so you really have to treat them as separate entities. Like dogs will, they're resilient, and so are cats, and they generally don't show you in both species um, that they have something wrong with them until it's really bad, but then when you hit that point where you find the cancer, um, it, it really, depending on the disease, um, will determine how they're going to do. But 
And a, a good example of treating cats versus dogs with radiation. Dogs will burn with radiation. Cats don't, and we don't really understand why. Huh. Mm -hmm. I think another issue is that each individual case of cancer is different. Mm -hmm. The same cancer in, in, the same species of the, in the same species, even related animals, can be two completely different things, which is why what makes Dr. Kim's job so much more difficult, cancer is not cancer is not cancer. We all might give it the same name, but then they act differently biologically. And so Dr. Kim has the job of determining what's the best treatment for the biological entity called cancer in dog A, which might be the same name as a biological entity in dog B, but it's the understanding of that. And I think Dr. Kim is being modest because she also did some cancer research. Mm -hmm. So she has a better background than a lot of veterinary oncologists. So <clears throat> let, let's go into that a little bit. Uh, you have two dogs that come in with uh, essentially the same mm -hmm. cancer. How do you know that treatment A is going to work for this dog and treatment B for that dog? You don't know. No, you don't. So what do you how what what do you do as as a doctor? Do you uh, do you, do you try both treatments and, well, and sort of observe or? So an example that I can think of is lymphoma. Lymphoma is the most common cancer that we treat in dogs and cats. And when you treat lymphoma, about 80 to 90 percent of dogs with the standard protocol that most people use will respond. But then you've got this subset, the one in 10 who don't respond. And when you're faced with that golden retriever who has lymphoma, and you, you, you sometimes just don't know. And so you go through the first two or three treatments, and one of the dogs will live a year or longer and the other one doesn't. And I think that we're really in our infancy at understanding cancer in general. Like, I think that the layperson believes that we understand more than we do. Mm -hmm. And when we look at lymphoma, as an example, um, generally we type it as two different types, B cell or T cell. Um, but we know that in human medicine, they subtype the lymphomas many, many different ways. And so I know that my GI lymphomas aren't going to do as well as my standard B cell lymphoma with big lymph nodes. Um, and so even though it's not really, we all know that the GI lymphomas don't do as well, but it's not well known. So mm -hmm. just to clarify, GI lymphoma refers to the gastrointestinal tract or the intestines and stomach, whereas the, lymph, the other lymphoma that Dr. Kim mentioned is in the lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So two different organs, so we can understand why it might not respond the same way, but the understanding is not at the level where you can just go in and give this drug. Now, is, is your treatment primarily drugs, or do you also do surgery? Yeah. So I joke that I titrate poison for a living. <laughs> <laughs> so I give chemotherapy. That is my job. Uh -huh. And um, there are surgical oncologists out there, and there are radiation oncologists. And so I'm medical oncology. So my job is to educate the clients on the different treatment options. And if they need radiation, send them to a radiation oncologist. If they need surgery, to send them to a boarded surgeon um, and work with them to develop a plan that works with them. And then I do their follow-up. So I am the person that they come to first to go through all their options, and then I stay with them to the, to the end if they let me. Okay, now that means you must be using a wide number of diagnostic tools, mm -hmm. MRIs, uh, x-rays, all that sort of thing? Yeah. So at our hospital, we have an MRI, we have a CT scanner, um, we just got a new ultrasound machine, which is beautiful. <laughs> and of course, we have our standard x-rays and blood machines, and then there are more advanced tests that we can do for certain types of cancers that look at specific protein markers that help enable me as a cancer clinician to say, okay, this is going to be a worse cancer than this right. other one. And these are tests that we didn't have 10 years ago, some of them not five years ago. So the cancer field is very exciting diagnostically because there's so many new things coming out. And so I love going to the conferences and seeing, ooh, what are they doing there? So yes. who's doing this kind of research? Mm -hmm. Are there particular uh, universities that are specializing mm -hmm. in cancer research now? or? Is this being done by the pharmaceutical companies? Um, where, where is all this oncology research coming for pets? It's mostly human stuff. It's that, mostly human. Human stuff that we've extrapolated into the veterinary world. But more and more, we're realizing that some of the human researchers 
can use the animal model as a, as a model, as a wild type model to work on drugs that they're using. So um, right now we're doing a drug study at a hospital, which is a drug that they hope to get into the human market eventually, and we're trialing it on dogs now, and it's very exciting. Like, I can't talk about the drug, but I'm very excited about it. So, in other words, if, if I understand you correctly, that they are actually testing drugs and development mm -hmm. on, on animals, well, that would be normal for human mm -hmm. testing on animals first, but they're actually allowing it to go into the veterinary community yeah. to test it there. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. It's amazing. And the other thing, I just want to put a little point in, we as immunologists are looking at different treatments that can be used in cancer, mm -hmm. but in the end, most, most veterinarians understand that it's one health, one medicine, and that we're all coming together as biological entities. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are, some of the, what are some of the basic range of types of medicines you're using? You did mention one particular for animals that has come out on the market, yes. and then you say you're using quite a few human oh, yeah. uh, medicines. So what, what, are the, what is the range that we're talking about here? Um, range in terms of types of drugs? Yes. So most of the drugs, probably 90% of the drugs that I use are human drugs, old human drugs, things that... Adriamycin. Adri yes, vincristine, cytoxin, and then we have some more higher level things that we do. So there's the melanoma vaccine that's available for dogs with melanoma. I've actually used it in a horse um, and a rabbit. Um, I've given it to a cat um, with limited success, unfortunately. Um, and then there are two um, oral drugs that are available for dogs with mast cell tumors um, in a separate class of drugs. So chemotherapy works by attacking rapidly dividing cells, and this class of drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, work by actually targeting a specific protein. So they're called molecularly targeted therapies, and they're the new wave of cancer. So all the new things, like if you are a news junkie and you watch TV and you see you know, new drug, small cell lung cancer in a human and this person was supposed to live a month and they lived two years, a lot of these new developments are these types of drugs that will be coming out. So it's, it's a hugely expanding field. Oh, for heaven's sakes. We have to take a break and when we come back I would like to talk about some specific cases. This is You and Your Pet. I'm Jim Horton and we'll be right back. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. Welcome back to You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton, and we're here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers, and our special guest. And we would like to turn now to some of the cases that you've handled, if we could do that. Yeah, this is pretty exciting that we as general practitioners, us out in the field doing the vaccines, the spays, that we have an opportunity to send these animals for additional quality of life treatment. And that's the bottom line. We just don't treat them to keep them alive. We treat them to give them a better quality of life. And so Dr. Kim has been kind enough to bring in a couple of animals. And we have one here. I believe this is Monty. Yes. And this is Monty after treatment? He, this is during treatment, I during believe. During treatment. So I think that Dad took these pictures a couple days ago when I asked him for pictures. <laughs> and so Monty, I like to say, proves to us that age is not a disease. Because a lot of clients will say, well, look, my dog's 13, 14 years old. Is it worth me pursuing chemotherapy and so Monty has lymphoma which is what we treat with chemotherapy um, and he went through 16 treatments of lymphoma of chemotherapy for lymphoma and he lived I think over a year before his disease came out of remission and now we're about midway through his second cycle of chemotherapy and he's doing great and I think he's like 15 and a half. Oh my yeah that is quite well uh, well yeah. up there. Yeah. 
I, that, that, was a, that was an issue that I know we had touched on <clears throat> briefly, but do cancers tend to show up when the, the animals are older or yes. do they show up at all the times? Yeah, because in order for cancer to happen, um, you need to have a cell go through many changes through its lifetime and for your body to recognize that a change occurred and not get rid of that cell. And so what they've shown through cancer biology and colon cancer in humans is that typically a cell needs to go through at least six changes in order for cancer to occur. So if you see an animal who's under the age of one, then you really worry that there's something inherently wrong with their system to be able to say that something's wrong versus right. And mm -hmm. so I want to see animals at 8, 9, 10, 13, 14 with cancer. I don't like seeing the ones who are right, two and four. Right, because then there's something genetically wrong, chances are, with them, mm -hmm. or something that they've been exposed to in utero, in the mm -hmm. mother, that has initiated this. And we know, as many of us as veterinarians know, certain drugs should not be given to animals when they are pregnant. And so one of the consequences can be death of the fetus, but it can also be long-term changes in the fetus. I think another point I'd like to make just before we go, before we go on to the next point uh, or the next case, dogs are different and cats are different based on their species. When I was in school, if someone said cancer, you wrote down either boxer or Bernese mountain dog <laughs> because they have it all the time. And that was, I mean, that was just a joke, you know. Oh, the third question asks, what kind of dog would I have cancer? Oh, boxer, mm -hmm. because it's just more common in some of these dogs. And then dogs, depending on their breeding cycle and history, can also be more common mm -hmm. to have cancer. So it, it can also be breed specific as well as age specific. Yeah, golden retrievers probably make up 30 to 40 percent of my practice. And I lost my dog, my golden retriever, uh, to lymphoma. So this is essentially a genetic mutation that has come down the line it's, of golden retrievers. It's not just genetics. There, so. Cancer is so much more complicated than that, and it's never that simple. So yes, there is a genetic component, and Goldens are much more prone to developing it, but they don't get heart disease, and they don't right. get other diseases that would otherwise shorten, ha their, shorten lives. their lives. So this is, this is what they die of, but it's not because they're genetically altered, it's because that's, their bodies allow that to happen. I'm sure if we could take humans and make sure that this human only mated with this human, it's called hybrid vigor. Mm -hmm. If you limited who could marry who and have children, you might find similar things. And we see that in different ethnic communities. In the Jewish community, Tay Sachs. In the black community and the Mediterranean community, sickle cell. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's a limited gene pool. So you can have some genetic components, as might be happening in boxers and uh, Bernese mountain dogs, but. As Dr. Kim says, if it was that easy, you wouldn't have to go to medical school for four years and do a residency for three years <laughs> and do research for multiple years. I mean, it would just be as easy as this is the cancer, give this, it's done. Mm -hmm. So can we go on to the second case? Or sure. Do you have no, question? no, I think we... So in essence, as we go on, it's, it's, it's an elusive disease <clears throat> in many ways. Yeah, we don't understand it as well as people hope we did. So. Right. I mean, some things are easy to treat. Mm -hmm. And but, who is this? This is Tiger Lily, she's beautiful. So she is a girl with lymphoma as well. And we went through, uh, I think the entire Madison, Wisconsin protocol. No, we stopped at week 17, I think. And she failed the protocol about a little over halfway through the protocol. Just to interject, in chemotherapy, there are different combinations of drugs and these combinations of drugs are called protocols. And of course, oncologists being who they are, they name them after themselves quite often. And so Dr. Kim just referred to a specific protocol of chemotherapy, certain drugs at certain times over the course of the treatment yeah. of the disease. So her <clears throat> protocol was to be 16 treatments over 25 weeks. And at week 17, she failed this protocol. And when that happens, we switched to a different protocol. So we started her on a rescue protocol. And I pretty much told mom, I don't really know if she's going to respond, and if she does, maybe two or three months. Well, Tiger Lily decided, uh-uh, no way. Um, I know, and when, when she was at her worst, we really thought she had days to live. Mm -hmm. So we gave her this chemo, and mom, the couple days after chemo, really thought she wasn't going to make it, and then she turned around, and it's been over a year since we started rescue therapy. So she is my winner in terms of cats with a number of cycles of this rescue, particular rescue protocol that mm -hmm. I've done with her. How did you know that at 
that number of weeks that the product protocol had failed. What was the test you did that told you that this just isn't working? Was the lymphoma increasing in size or, mm -hmm. or is, was yeah. that? Yeah, but before I even did that test, the ultrasound to look at her disease, because her disease is in her belly, Tiger Lily pretty much told us because she always growled and we always had this routine and she came in and she didn't growl, she didn't fight us and mom said, you know, she's not doing well. I'm really worried about her. And that, more than anything else, clues us in. So we usually know that an animal is out of remission mm -hmm. before we even touch that. Okay. All right. Animals that are getting healthier and healthier tend to get feistier and feistier. Mm -hmm. All righty. So why don't we take a look at the next one here. The next one is a uh, golden retriever. And quite often, this is, the, this is the stage I see them at. They come in, often we have a crisis in veterinary medicine right now where people just either don't have money or don't have the time because of their work ethic to bring the animals in and quite often we see tumors coming in this big. Now this one I believe was referred to Dr. Kim. Yeah, so this is Chevy and Chevy has a fibrosarcoma type of cancer of his nose and the owners elected not to pursue any further treatments but it's, it's kind of a profound example of what we can see and how big tumors can get. And Chevy could care less. He was not in pain. He was eating great. He just looked funny. He was a happy, healthy dog with a lump. <laughs> and so we... I, I, I would be amazed if I saw an animal like that, that uh, somebody hadn't asked the question of what's the matter with the animal. I, is it possible that that some pet owners really don't understand their animals that well? No, I think they I think they do understand and it's that I would say that probably in my experience 90% of owners if they get a diagnosis of cancer don't want to do anything because we've been trained to believe that cancer is not a treatable disease in It's animals. a death sentence. Yeah, and it is right. really treatable. And I think most owners when they see a lump they say, "Oh, it's nothing." Mm -hmm stuck himself with, a, with a, a stick or something and, you know, oh, wait a minute now, it probably has an abscess, we'll yeah. just wait. It's People tend to bury their, their head and we know that happens among humans. Mm -hmm. um, a close relative of mine found out he had prostate cancer, didn't believe it, didn't do anything and died about a year later. So people tend not to want to hear about the big C and they don't want to know that it exists. And mm -hmm. so, unfortunately, education's only part of the issue. It's understanding that it can also be treated, as Dr. Kim said. About how old was this animal? Nine. He was nine. Mm -hmm. So he was, frankly, still pretty young. Yeah. Uh, Relatively. He, he, yeah, yeah, he had a number of years he could have gone. Yeah. And how long after this picture did he continue? I don't know, because he, he only came in once, okay. and then I lost him to follow up. Okay. What do we have next? This is an interesting picture. What is going on here? Well, I, I think we have to make the point. Yeah. We have a guest with us off camera here, but this is another technician. And, and Dr. Kim works, again, in a group of people with everyone carrying a little bit of the load. Dr. Kim doesn't carry it all. I don't carry it all as a general practitioner. And this is one of the team members that she has mm -hmm. working with the animal. So Dr. Kim, if you'd like to just describe what this. Yeah. So I rely on my team heavily. I introduce myself as Dr. Kim, and this is Heather and Rebecca, and we're a team, um, so that my clients realize that it's not just me. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is Rebecca, one of my technicians. Um, and then on the ground is Zena, and she is a dog. Uh, you can't really see, but she's. Um, been amputated, one of her legs was taken off for bone cancer, and she's actually getting chemotherapy in this picture. So Rebecca is wearing a mask and um, a mask and gloves to protect herself from the chemo. Um, and then the chemo is that red line of fluid that's going into the dog. All right, and exactly now, you put the chemo straight into the bloodstream? Is that mm -hmm. is that what you do? Yep. Okay, I, I know so little about yeah. this that I, I have to ask these sorts of... Yeah, uh, so Xena has an intravenous catheter that's been placed and we're dripping the chemo into her. Other chemos will give us a straight injection into the vein. It just depends on what the drug is. We have some oral chemos as well. How is this particular animal doing? Great. Great? Fantastic. Even with a leg that's been amputated? Yeah, dogs do amazingly well on three legs. And I like to tell clients, because clients have such an emotional hurdle to take a leg off their animal. They really feel like 
it's just not right to do because you wouldn't do it really in the human world. They do bone salvage procedures a lot, but in, in dogs, I love watching a dog wake up from anesthesia after we've amputated their leg because they have this look in their eyes like, oh, what's going on? And then they realize that the thing that hurt them is off of them, and they're thrilled. Most dogs, when we do an amputation, they're walking and running around within hours. Oh, I think the other point that we have to make is cancer is associated with pain. And I happen to do a lot of pain management. I'm sure Dr. Kim does too. And so we try and maintain this quality of life immediately after surgery, but also during the treatment of cancer. We, try, we tend to use a lot of pain medication, the appropriate pain medication. And again, there are protocols for the pain medication that we can use in these animals to again enhance the quality of life and I want to make that the point that it's not just to keep these animals alive but to enhance their quality of life. Mm -hmm. How does the animal communicate pain? I know there must be a number of different ways mm -hmm. but how does an owner look at this animal and say Fifi has got to be in pain? Well there's simple things like if they limp um, but it's really a, it's a hard task to really understand and owners ask me that all the time and sometimes my answer is I don't know. But what we do see with animals who are painful is that they will seek places that they haven't sought before, like to sleep in areas they haven't slept before, sleep in positions they've never slept before. Um, stop eating. You stop eating, yep. Um, hunched over. Become aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways that they can manifest it. We've run out of time, so I want to thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for coming and being on the air with us. and. I've learned a lot tonight that I didn't know anything about, and I'm sure our viewers have learned as much, too. This has been You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton, and thank you very much for watching.